I don't stand, I'll fall asleep, right? <laughs> um, and you've heard too much from me, but I'm going to try and say a few words that might be about the past, but it applies to now. First, my most important political lesson that I ever learned was burning my school down, or trying to burn my school down. That was in 1977, after I first became active in 1976. And the attempt was to try and get other kids who had gone back to school to boycott school. And the only thing I got was several spells in prison at the age of 15, 16, 17 and 18. But what I learned, and I undertook from that time, was that that was an attempt at a shortcut to get change. And the real change came from learning and passing on knowledge and organizing on that basis. So I want to start off by probably an example of the Treatment Action Campaign's work that is hardly ever mentioned. Um, and that is its case against two drug companies, one called Beringer Ingelheim and the other one uh, GlaxoSmithKline, which would be more familiar to most, most people. The one is a German company and the other one is a British company. And when tax started, those two drug companies' medicines was costing $10,000 a month in the US. And it was costing about 15 to 20,000 rand a month here. And that was life-saving. So I want to talk to you about corporate power and a check on corporate power and what we need to do. So where am I going to start? I'm going to start in a place called the Eastern Cape, which many people, some people here will, would be from and other people here would know, know about. And um, it is in the old Transkai closer to Ponderland, the Siki Siki. Um, Close to Lusiki Siki, uh, there's a village, and a woman called Norute Nobula saw on television tax protests and the fact that people were getting antiretrovirals in Kailicha in 2001. She was sick, she got in a bus, she found a shack in Saitsi in Kailicha, she went to the clinic, uh, she told them she had HIV and she wanted to live. She got medicines. Now, Sister Ruta had no formal education. No formal education. She, her English is almost, almost non-existent. And yet, she was one of the people at the forefront of education about science, and she still is today, education about medicines, education about clinical work. In 2001, there were fewer than there were fewer than a thousand people on treatment through the public sector. But the medicines that was used was not paid for by the government. It was paid for by Medicines on Frontier, Doctors Without Borders. And a few clinical trials that were happening that drug companies were sponsored. But Kailich is a community organization and largely made up, the majority of the population live in informal settlements. So it was a totally different environment than a clinical trial. So what happened? In September 2001, in August 2001, we launched a case against the South African government for the prevention of mother to child transmission. But in September 2001, we launched a complaint with the Competition Commission to bring the prices of the medicines down. And I'll come back to explaining what happened. The first time we joined government was in 2001. And this is about how you can support government when it does the right thing. Uh, our first health minister, Dr. Nkosazana Lamini Zuma, was now chair, uh, what, not chair, um, Boss of the OAU, uh, yeah, <laughs> chairperson of the, uh, of the African Union. Uh, she was a brilliant health minister. I mean, she's not the most charming person. 
I don't think she likes human beings. <laughs> but she was a brilliant health minister. She supported women's right to terminate their pregnancy. She made sure that clinic was, clinics were created. She dealt with TB, primary health care, essential drug list. And she decided to make uh, what was called uh, pass a law that allowed drug companies to uh, uh, medicines to be substituted, generic substitution, and to import brand name medicines cheaper if they were made by the same company and sold cheaper in other countries. 39 drug companies, global drug companies, Swiss, from Switzerland to France to the United States, all took us to court, the South African government. But as you know, governments are notoriously bad for making decent arguments, especially um, the South African government. But how did that drug company case come about? Behind the drug companies was enormous trade pressure. Trade pressure. And the trade pressure came from a man, man called Bill Clinton, who in 1996 placed South Africa on a sanctions watch list. That means they were going to implement sanctions if that law passed, trade sanctions against South Africa. So we went to court against the drug companies first with the government and then later we took the drug companies themselves to court. Now when we went to court against the drug companies, you know these corporations are global. They have enormous power. If you take a company like Merck Sharp Dome, MSD, it's, it's basically colonized Botswana's healthcare system. But its income is larger, larger than the Botswana D GDP. Yeah. Right? So you imagine, Bill Clinton doesn't have much power. Obama doesn't have much power. When companies like that approach them, they're scared. They are seriously scared. Because the amount of money that goes through drug companies, through the arms industry, through the oils industry, through finance capital and so on, is much larger than that in any country in the world. And so countries are at the mercy of corporations. National governments are at the mercy of co corporations. So Bill Clinton did what the drug companies told him to do. But he didn't reckon on activism. And so we started mobilizing and demonstrating outside the U.S. Embassy, um, outside any U.S. person speaking in South Africa. <laughs> and we were joined by a group called ACT UP uh, in New York. And we were joined by Medicines on Frontier. And we were joined by a, a thing called Consumer Project on Technology. And what these people did is they organized, you know, after Clinton, the person who challenged George Bush and who lost because the Supreme Court of the United States appointed George Bush was a chap called Al Gore. And as Gore was going around the United States starting for the primary elections, ACT UP went after him at everything and said Gore greed kills and then explained what was happening. And I promise you within a month, Clinton dropped the sanctions list because we were demonstrating here outside the embassies and wherever the US was and ACT UP was making the presidential race uncomfortable. Um, so that was a combination of activism. But the most important thing is people like Cisna Rutte came to understand what the World Trade Organization's trips the trade-related aspects of intellectual property, what that meant, and what you could use, and that what our governments were trying to do was justifiable under TRIPS. And that led to the 2001 Doha Declaration, which said that poor countries could use uh, TRIPS to bring the prices of medicines down, which is exactly what Nkosa Zayat Lamini Zuma wanted to do. So, by now, about 600 people a day were dying in South Africa of AIDS-related illnesses. And many, many, I can't tell you how many people died. I remember the names of the people who died, who fought with us, who joined the struggle. 
apart from the people I know closely, I don't remember the names of the living ones. And what happened is we went to, call, we went to the Competition Commission. Now, no one had ever before used competition law in this way. And what the competition law in South Africa says is that no company can charge an excessive price to the detriment of consumers if they have a dominant market share. And as you know, a patent gives a drug company officially about 20 years, but they keep on pushing it to 20, 30, 40, 50 years. 50 years is what they really want. And that means they can charge any price they like. So by that time, the medicines would have cost a person 4,500 rand a month. The median income in South Africa today, the median income is, th is 2,500 rand a month. That's the median income today in South Africa. So that was a couple of years ago. Um, so the question then was, was the Competition Commission going to listen to us? Now, a critical thing was that we had to know how these drugs were made, AZT, 3TC, and Averapine. They were made by the NIH, the National Institute for Health in the United States, and at, univers at universities funded by the NIH. So the drug companies had not spent money themselves on the basic science research for, the, for these medicines. Mm. The United, United States government had, 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 and it's the medicines I take today which still keeps me alive today. It was made by people who worked on campuses in the United States that made these drugs. And the drug companies were then given them to develop. And you know that the drug companies spend more on marketing than they spend on research. Right? More on marketing than on research. Right? So what happens next is we get to study these facts. And obviously, because our president doesn't believe that HIV causes AIDS, then um, I still believe he should be in jail for allowing up to 3 million people to die. Um, uh, I'm not one of those people who believe he is a decent human being. Um, but that aside, you can ask me about that some other time. Um, too many people have died for that. Um, so, um, we had to study what was in these drugs. We had to study every side effect. We had to go to virologists in labs to sp explain how HIV testing, what the CD4 count was, what a, what you call it, a, a viral load test is. And we took people like Cisnorute to virologists, um, like Lynn, I can't remember Lynn's surname now. Lynn Sorry? No, no. Uh, she's a virologist at UCT. We had to take them to, to them. And like suddenly these virologists who'd never seen ordinary human beings would just sit in the lab and look at the things. They're so excited. And as you know, scientists don't know how to explain things to people. <laughs> mostly, mostly. There are some smart scientists. I mean, some communicative scientists as opposed to... <laughs> as opposed to non-smart scientists. Scientists are mostly smart. So um, she went, uh, we, we took, and, and suddenly these scientists saw, we can have an alliance with these people. The doctors, the nurses, they all joined. So if you go to the complaint, the complaint to the competition commission, you'll see it starts with a person living with HIV, you'll see there's a nurse on there, you'll see there's a there are a number of doctors who joined the case against the drug companies. You'll see churches and trade unions and tech, right? we all there. So the question is how you build alliances. So it's not just getting the knowledge and applying the knowledge at community level, but it's also, it's also about bringing uh, legal knowledge to bear. And that legal knowledge really, really helped. And getting people to understand competition law was not that difficult. But were we going to win? Because in the middle of this, the Competition Commission was reporting up. And as you know, if you report up and up doesn't believe, 
then you do it down. So we didn't know what was going to happen. Two years later, in October 2003, the Competition Commission um, announced that they would take steps against the dry companies. Now what we had asked for is we had asked for five generic licenses to be issued to generic companies. Because if you have less than five, the price just drops slightly. Economically shown, statistically shown, if you have more than five, a hell of a lot, the price drops significantly. Very significantly. So we asked for five. Then they said, well, we'll give you, we'll, we'll be prepared to talk to you about South Africa, but we won't talk to you about other parts of Africa. They said, no deal. No deal if other African countries can't do the same or can't be included in the deal. So they said, sub-Saharan Africa, where the epidemic is strongest or wherever there's a serious epidemic. So that's why Aspen sells its medicines now to the north and, and, and so on. So to come back, the drug companies, when we walked into our first meeting with them, this is the first thing they did. They said to us, We've never lost a case at the Competition Commission. And the company, I think it was either this company, Weber Wenzel, <laughs> or Norton Rose. It was one of the two. Um, it was either them or Norton Rose. But either way, <laughs> we just looked at them and we said, and when we signed, a, 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 because they, the drug companies were scared, if they had to go to the Competition Tribunal, they would have had to justify how they, how much money they spent. They would have had to reveal the data. And that's one thing that the drug companies will not do. They will not give you actual data of how much it costs them to develop a compound. Right? So actually, when they came to sign their agreement with us, they were much chastened. And as we finished, I said, you know, I've never been involved in a court case that we lost. <laughs> so, so but, uh, sorry for that little bit of brag, but uh, it shows you can win. It shows you can win. And the people who won was not me bragging to the, to the lawyers that I've never lost a case, and I'm not a lawyer, and I've never studied law. It's the people who, in informal settlements, the women who were dying with HIV, who took their bodies, and their voices. They learned the drug names. Those who couldn't read sang them. Mm. Those who could read them on posters, read a little bit, read them on posters. Those who could read more, read them in, read them in pamphlets. Those who had formal education, read them in policy documents. But no one was judged as too stupid, too uneducated to learn science, to learn economics, and to learn law, to learn epidemiology, to learn statistics, to learn any number of things. And that is where power lies, if that knowledge is transferred. Today, there are, the government says that there are about three and a half million people on ARV treatment in South Africa. We know that there are at least two million people. We also know that there are some very serious stockouts at the moment and stuff like that. But at least two million people live because of people like Cisno Rute. And it was the first pushback on global corporations since the WTO had started. And we were able to unify with people in Zambia, in Malawi, in Mozambique, in Zimbabwe, in uh, uh, Senegal, in Brazil, in Chile, in Britain, in France, in Germany. Everywhere we had co comrades. And when our government, for instance, refused to make medicines available through the public sector, I remember we had demonstrations, mass demonstration, it was 14th February 2003. Uh, we first marched past the US Embassy where we told them they're wasting money on war. And 
they must bugger off, they must stop the war. And then we marched to our parliament to, to talk about a treatment plan. And on that day, in 170 countries across the world, Thailand to Timbuktu, no, not Timbuktu, I don't think Timbuktu, but <laughs> Thailand to, you know what I mean. Across the, across the world, people put 600 pairs of shoes down in front of South African embassies. Right? Saying, representing the number of deaths a day of people who are dying. Similarly, government still wouldn't. We brought the prices down significantly. We got those prices down to first 300 rand a month. Now the medicines that I take, the government pays 28 rand a month for it. 28 rand a month. And that used to cost 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 rand a month. Right? It shows you, and Aspen makes a lot of profits for. So, to come back to the last point, when government was still refusing to make these medicines available, one of the things, we, first we won a case on the right of pregnant women to have AZT on a European for to prevent mother to child transmission. But we didn't want to go to court on ARVs because of the cost that would involve. And the court might be very conservative. So we thought we we're first going to go to the streets. So we went to the streets and they wouldn't listen for years. And finally, we decided civil disobedience. And we went into police stations and we handed ourselves on, uh, say, you either arrest the health minister or you arrest us. And eventually Jacob Zuma negotiated with us on behalf of government and we got a treatment plan. So today people are alive because the poorest people in our country unified with some of the most powerful people in the world, including the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, UNAIDS, WHO, and so on. And it's critical to understand that we can win. And the recipe for winning is first starting with rights. Everyone has a right to life, to dignity, to, to healthcare access, and so on. The second thing is to do decent research, very decent research from across the spectrums, interdisciplinary. To learn those things and to teach them. To learn them yourself as an activist and to teach them where people do not have the knowledge. To mobilize, to build alliances, to educate the media, to build your own media. And if you need to, to use the courts. But to use the courts creatively to use it in a way that you come at a side of law that has never been used or that people won't think you're going to use. Right? And so it's important for us to know that no matter how powerful something is, you can change it. And it depends on how you yourself approach politics, economics, law, social science, and hard science. Thank you.